Before we get going, I wanted to announce that I have decided to team up with fellow YouTuber and good friend Flemlo Raps to launch Sports Therapy. This is a brand new podcast that shows a side of us that you don't see in our videos. If you love what we do here on YouTube, come support us by stopping by and giving us a listen and some feedback. Links will be down below. Thank you in advance. To get into the right mood for this video, try and picture this. You are 18 years old, and you're the best player to ever come out of your high school. Not only that, out of literally more than a million athletes playing this sport, you're arguably the best of them all. They're talking about you on TV, you're being given national recognition, and you are literally bathing in the countless scholarships that schools have offered you. Wherever you go, they are going to make a huge deal about your arrival. But here's the catch. If you don't dominate at the next level, set school records, and leave an unforgettable legacy, you're going to be considered a massive disappointment to everybody. And any sort of relevance that you received following your football career is because you were a bust. How's it going everybody? I'm KTO, and today we're going to be talking about the top 10 recruits from the year 2010, see if they lived up to the expectations, and look at how far they went with the sport. In the past, I have used ESPN's ranking system, but today we're using Rivals. Anyways, let's not waste any more time and dive into the video. When it comes to running backs who can do it all, Marcus Lattimore was that dude. He showcased a beautiful blend of elusiveness, ball carrier vision, and power. As the number one ranked running back coming out of high school, Lattimore took his talents to South Carolina. Even as a true freshman in the SEC, he was a man amongst boys. In just his second career college game, Lattimore broke 42 tackles on 37 carries, rushing for 182 yards and two touchdowns against Georgia. He would eventually be named NCAA Freshman of the Year. The future seemed so bright for this dude. Unfortunately, he was robbed of his football career his junior season. You're welcome to watch. It's not pretty. Lattimore with lathers on top. You see number 24 in white, Gordon, come racing in, helmet on knee. Yeah. Oh. Marcus Lattimore would never be the same. He tried his luck in the NFL, and because of his talent, he was still selected in the fourth round by the 49ers. He fought as long as he could, but abruptly in 2014, at 23 years old, he had to officially retire altogether. The damage done to his knee was too much to overcome. Currently, he is a member of South Carolina's coaching staff. Standing at 6 foot 3, Derek Rogers was big, explosive, and nearly impossible to cover on jump balls. His dominant senior season campaign cemented his place in the Georgia high school record books. He would find his rhythm on the field at the University of Tennessee. As a sophomore, he led the SEC in both receptions and yards. But ultimately, his career at Tennessee was a disappointment due to off-the-field issues. He failed three separate drug tests, which led him to being suspended indefinitely. Following this, Derek transferred to lower division school, Tennessee Tech. If you've ever been curious as to what would happen if a five-star level player was placed on a lower level college football team, well, in the team's fourth game, Derek caught 18 passes for 303 yards. Following the season, he decided to enter the NFL draft. This decision to leave school early proved to be costly. Derek did not get selected in the draft that season, and at this point, there was no turning back. Starting from the bottom, he worked his way from practice squads to roster spots to eventually contributing to the Colts' pass game. But after being arrested for a DUI, the Colts released him, and he never played another snap. Coming in at our number 8 spot, Owamabe Odigizuwa, who I will be referring to as Owa, was one of the top defensive linemen in the country. Growing up, he was a basketball and track kid, but by 8th grade, he decided to try football and realized it was the sport for him. 
In a few short years, Owa developed into a 6'3", 230-pound beast of a defensive end. His 18 sacks that he got his junior season helped him become one of the most highly coveted recruits in the nation. After dominating high school football in Oregon, he accepted a scholarship to go play for UCLA. For his time in college, I wouldn't say that he lived up to the five-star caliber expectations. His career was sort of overshadowed by injuries and surgeries. But putting expectations aside, Owa eventually found his rhythm once he was healthy. As a fifth year senior, he achieved second team all pack 12. And perhaps most importantly, he was one of the emotional leaders of the team. Despite not putting up eye-popping numbers in college, he was still considered a pro prospect based on his raw athleticism. His combine numbers were incredible and even some scouting reports described his weaknesses as, quote, not many. He would eventually be drafted by the New York Giants in 2015, but after two seasons full of injuries and not much impact, the Giants released him. He never made another official roster after 2016. The number seven recruit of 2010 was the top player coming out of New York. His name was Dominic Easley, a flat out beast of a defensive tackle who decided to commit to Florida. This man was flat out unblockable. Just watch him push this center back. When he was healthy, he could not be contained. But that was just the thing. He suffered two torn ACLs, immediately putting up red flags to NFL teams. Now, when it comes to dudes who are mega talented like this guy, you gotta weigh the possibilities and risks. If he could stay healthy, there was no denying how good he could become. But that was just the thing. We didn't know. The Patriots saw an opportunity and decided to take this risk and picked him in the first round of the 2014 NFL Draft. This risk did not pay off. Both his first two years landed him on injured reserve. Following that, the Patriots released him. He finally managed to stay healthy in 2016, putting up decent numbers. But then in 2017, he suffered another torn ACL. In 2018, it would happen again, marking five serious knee injuries for him. At this point, I'm just hoping this poor dude will be able to move normally throughout the future. We're going to move past number six for now, and we're going to pair him up with the number three recruit later on. You'll see why, but for now, let's move on to number five. Widely considered the top safety in high school in 2010, Keenan Allen initially committed to Alabama. But before signing day, Keenan had a change of heart and switched his commitment to Cal to play with his half-brother. He also made this decision because he wanted to play wide receiver instead of safety. Looking at where his career went, I'd have to say he made the right choice. Once over the top, wide right open, right on the button to Allen. He still has one and makes a shift to the 30. At the 25-20, Allen at the 15-10, stumbles, touchdown! In just three years, he set the school record for receptions in a career. His 2011 season stood out the most, putting up over 1,300 yards on nearly 100 catches. Keenan received high praise from NFL scouts. Following his junior season, some argued that he was the best receiver in the class. But he did sustain an injury as a junior that dropped his stock just a bit, and he went on to be selected in the third round by the San Diego Chargers. At the beginning of his rookie season, he was so far down the depth chart that he actually considered quitting football altogether and going back to school to finish his studies. But he stuck it out, and it panned out for him. Rivers on the middle, Allen, a tackle, and he will into the end zone for the touchdown. Despite fighting injuries his whole career, Keenan Allen has been one of the better receivers in football throughout his time in the NFL, and is currently on a stretch of three consecutive Pro Bowl seasons. Sharif Floyd grew up in an abusive home, and at school, he was bullied. By the age of 16, he was on his own, and to survive, he made money any way he could, often resorting to eating lunch out of a trash can and working all day to buy dinner that night. With role models few and far between, he gravitated towards his football coach, Michael Edwards. Michael told him that if he trusted in him, Sharif would be able to go to college completely paid for. By the end of high school, Sharif Floyd was the highest rated defensive tackle in the country, standing at a massive 6 foot 3, 310 pounds. After receiving offers from all around the country, he committed to Florida. He became a starter right away, and by his junior year, Sharif dominated. 
His 2012 campaign got him All-American honors, first team All-SEC, and a first round selection in the NFL Draft. He developed into a solid starter for the Vikings, but things would go drastically wrong. Sharif suffered an injury, and due to how it was handled, he filed a $180 million lawsuit against high-profile sports surgeon Dr. James Andrew. To briefly summarize, the surgery was unsuccessful, which was followed by a post-operative treatment that was done without Floyd's consent. This would cause permanent injury. It also included leaving Sharif partially paralyzed and the abrupt retirement of his football career. This was one of the most heartbreaking professional sports stories in recent memory. There's no recent news on the matter, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Let's hope this guy gets the justice he deserves. The next part of this video brings us a tale of two receivers. Our number six recruit, Robert Woods, and our number three recruit, Kyle Prater, who both committed to USC. Talk about a potential tandem in the making, right? With one a speedster and the other a jump ball specialist, the sky was the limit. But reality set in. They would end up on two separate paths. Robert Woods became an integral part of USC's offense, establishing himself as one of the better receivers in college football by 2011. Kyle Prater was forced to redshirt due to injury, and once he was healthy, played a background role to Robert Woods and Marquise Lee. He only caught one pass his sophomore year. Eventually, he transferred to Northwestern. Even there, Kyle did not produce big numbers. In three years, his best season amounted to only decent stats. That would be pretty much the end of his career. He attempted to make a run at the NFL, but nothing ever materialized. Going back to Robert Woods, he left school early to eventually be selected in the second round by Buffalo. Once there, he proved to be a consistent number two option for the Bills passing game, averaging pretty solid numbers throughout the contract. Things really took off though once he signed with the Rams. Under a much better system, Woods has thrived even more. Currently, he's coming off of back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons. Coming out of high school at a whopping 6'7", 296 pounds, the number two recruit, Chantrell Henderson, was the top offensive lineman in the country. He was such a beast that he was named National Offensive Player of the Year. He was the first offensive lineman to do so in the 28-year history of the award. As one of the most hyped up offensive linemen ever, Chantrell would join the Miami Hurricanes. Although he had moments on the field in college, Chantrell's off the field moments stood out more, which included three separate suspensions from the team. Later, he admitted that this was due to marijuana. Despite the lack of dominance that everyone had expected from this guy in college, he still had all the talent in the world and received an invite to the 2014 NFL Combine. He now weighed 331 pounds. He would just barely manage to get drafted, being selected 237th overall by the Buffalo Bills. Chantrell found his stride right away, becoming a standout rookie. He started all 16 games for the Bills and led the entire NFL in performance-based pay. But that would be the highlight of his NFL career. The following season, he would be diagnosed with Crohn's disease. This required surgery. And then he was suspended on two separate occasions for marijuana use that he himself admitted that he was using to deal with the pain from the Crohn's disease. He never managed to find much playing time again. He became a reserve for the Texans for two years. And after battling injuries, he was released for the final time midway through the 2019 season. Now, here we are. We have arrived at the unanimous number one overall recruit from the year 2010, a six foot three, 237 pound beast of an athlete, Ronald Powell. Ronald primarily played tight end, linebacker, and defensive end, dominating wherever he lined up. Even in the Army High School All-American Bowl, he played lights out. He was such a big deal at the time that an article in 2020 called him Florida's most hyped recruit ever. But like a lot of incredibly hyped up recruits, Powell never played up to that level. I feel like a broken record saying this, but he got injured multiple times. His best accolades while playing for the Gators included freshman All-SEC honors, and he led the team in sacks one year. This isn't exactly eye-popping stats for the school's supposed best recruit ever. Talent-wise, he was still viewed as a decent prospect at the next level, and was drafted in the fifth round by the Saints. After a few years of bouncing around practice squads and barely making it on rosters, he managed just two career tackles. He tried his luck in the startup AAF, but he was cut before the season began. And the 
Funny part was, man, I didn't even have my own computer. I would go over to some of my teammates, like their, their apartments, and I would use their computers to make these videos. So I would take over my little snowball mic and they would be like, okay, yeah, you can use the computer. And I would just sleep on their couch and edit like day and night until I got a video done. And I did that for my first like 20 to 25 videos.